one of the things that I've learned as I've gone along this journey is that it's okay to fail. Greatness comes when you not only are allowed to fail, but retain your enthusiasm after you fail and continue to battle so that you never give up. You continue to fight, continue to fight until you win. If I could do it, anybody can do it. But what you need is the opportunity to do it. And that's what is lacking. Today's PSA is brought to you by a well-known trailblazer and game changer in medicine, Dr. Clive Callender. With more than 50 years of experience, Dr. Callender is the epitome of excellence in healthcare and continues to break glass ceilings to improve inequities in the organ donation system. My name is Dr. James Hildreth, and you're listening to Public Service Announcement, a brand new podcast dedicated to making complicated healthcare topics easily digestible for all who listen. This season, we will focus on an array of topics like public health, health equity, data sciences, disease states, medical modernization, and more. In this episode, Dr. Callender takes us on his journey to becoming a renowned surgeon and pioneer of transplant medicine. We discuss everything from his beginnings in New York City to the difficulties he faced as he became a black doctor during the height of the civil rights movement in the early 1960s. We also touch on his continued advocacy to increase the pool of minority donors and black healthcare providers in transplant medicine. To learn more about this show or to learn more about Meharry Medical College, visit www.mmc.edu. Today's public service announcement is focused on transplantation equity, and our guests, our very special guest, is Dr. Clive Callender. So let's start at the beginning. Dr. Callender, can you tell us where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? I had a very interesting beginning of my life. and My mother had four children, and the first two girls, and then she had two boys. But during the first two years of her life, my two brothers actually died. And so it was her prayer that she have two boys. And uh, the Lord answered her prayer. And uh, lo and behold, uh, Clive and Carl Callender were the answer to her <laughs> okay. prayers. Uh, but uh, the uh, other side of the coin is that uh, within 48 hours of our delivery, my mother died uh, oh, from dear. complications of... Uh, purple sepsis in those days. It didn't have antibiotics, and she succumbed to that. Mm. Now, the one of the issues that was problematic was that my father was a railroad chef, and he was on the uh, railroad track going from New York to Boston, and so it wasn't really available to take care of us. So as a consequence, for the first two years of our life, we were actually in a foster home. And apparently I had illnesses as a child, and it was hard to take care of. The first foster family, one year of us was as much as they could take. And so we went to a second foster family. After that, my dad uh, remarried. Then uh, we went to live with my dad for two years. And uh, the second episode happened in which my stepmother had to be institutionalized because she was mentally ill. And so we went to live with my aunt, and that was really the beginning of the rest of my life because uh, she was a very religious woman and we spent most of our time in church. And at the age of seven, I actually accepted Christ as my personal Savior. And also around that time decided that uh, I wanted to become a medical missionary so that I could affect the souls of mankind and the bodies of mankind at the same time. And so this then became my life's goal and my life's dream at the age of seven. And so uh, it was interesting because a lot of the kids that I grew up with were getting juvenile delinquency cards. Mm -hmm. But I was spending my time in church learning how to read the Bible, learning how to do many things in church. I learned how to read, reading the Bible. And so, you know, they say Satan finds work for idle hands. Well, we weren't very idle, and so <laughs> as a consequence, we grew up very differently. This changed somewhat when I reached the age of 15 because it was there and then that I contracted pulmonary tuberculosis. Mm. And uh, 
I was taken to Harlem Hospital with a high fever, coughing up blood and those kinds of things, and uh, was put on isolation. You know, it was, there was no option about right. about isolation in those days. Mm-hmm. They, you were isolated, period. There wasn't right. any options given. But the, after six months, I didn't improve that well. Since at that time, there wasn't any good treatment for tuberculosis. They uh, decided that I needed to have half of my lung, if not all of my lung, removed because Mm -hmm. I wasn't healing. This was in 1951, and so they they didn't talk about healing you from TB. They talked about arresting you from TB in those days. So I was in the hospital there for 18 months, six months at Harlem Hospital, six months at Wilfer Island to recover from surgery. But the thing that happened that was really interesting is that they gave me a... uh, uh, IQ test to see what I could accomplish. And mm-hmm. they, the test revealed that I could accomplish anything that I wanted to accomplish. You went through a lot, didn't you? As, yeah, as I look back on it, you know. So one of the things about your life, Dr. Callan, is that you lived through some harsh realities in terms of the civil rights era when you were getting your education. How did that impact your choices about education and your approach to it? Well, you know, it's interesting that people ask me about that because uh, I was kind of oblivious to that in New York City because uh, in our schools, they segregated you based upon where you lived. And where you lived is determined where you went to elementary school, junior high school, high school. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I got out of uh, the hospital and returned to finish high school, what happened is that I knew nothing about the role that blacks played in education because it was all about white America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the only two blacks that were in history were George Washington Carver and County Cullen, mm-hmm. who, who was killed. And I, I was too young at that time to even understand uh, that we were not even included in the history books. So did that obliviousness affect your choices of where you're going to go for college and for medical school? How how did that play into that? Actually, uh, in New York City, it was interesting because uh, tuition then was about $20 a semester. Wow. And you got into college based upon your performance on examinations and your grade point averages. And so I went to Hunter College because that's, that's where my grades uh, sent me to. Mm. And I didn't do well. Uh, my first year at uh, Hunter College, I had a 1.8 mm. out of 4 average, uh, which was disappointing to many, uh, including my grade advisor who suggested that I didn't belong in the pre-med course because I didn't have what it takes. But something positive happened along along the line, and that, that was that... Uh, Professor Catherine Crydell saw my plight and suggested that I double major and major in physiology as well. And that was a turning point in my career at Hunter College because uh, from that point on, I never got anything other than an A in wow. physiology, in all the physiology courses. And I started to do better in all of my courses. And mm-hmm. I matured and recognized that English and history and speech and all those other things were as important as uh, uh, chemistry and, and physiology. My cumulative average when I applied to Meharry Medical College uh, was still uh, 2.5 out of 4. And nobody in their right mind except me thought that I had a <laughs> chance of getting into medical school. It was uh, kind of a, a blessing that one of my buddies a, a year ahead of me, Charles Norman Innes, finished at Hunter College a year be- before I did. Mm-hmm. But he did very well at Meharry. And I suspected that uh, that may have been the reason why I finally got accepted. But what was most uh, helpful about it was that there were six other blacks in my class. About 90% of the people in Hunter College were Jewish, and there were a few blacks. But all the black students who saw what happened to me and saw that I got accepted into medical school, just about all of them said if Clive could do it, anybody could do it. <laughs> and actually, they were right. They actually did it. And they actually got into medical school and made it. I applied to about seven medical schools. The only school that accepted me was Meharry Medical College. Hmm. Well, you clearly did well enough to get into a surgery residency. Can you tell me about the challenges you faced in getting into surgery residency? Because at the time, there weren't <laughs> many people who looked like us who did that. 
Well, <laughs> it's interesting that uh, what happened, which was really alarming, was that while I was a mediocre student at Hunter College at Meharry, because of the fact that I majored in physiology, I was the number one student in physiology mm. and in most classes. Wow. And so the first year, I actually uh, made the dean's list. And, uh, and I actually went back to Hunter College to tell my <laughs> professors how I had done. Of course, Norman Johan, who was my great advisor, who counseled me and told me that I didn't belong in medicine, uh, actually refused to meet with me because she said I was a liar and never got accepted into medical school <laughs> wow. in the first place. Wow. Uh, and so that was a little discouraging. But uh, And, of course, my twin brother and my sister, they were uh, uh, thought that I was lost my mind because I, we didn't have the money to go into medical school. And uh, as a matter of fact, my church uh, actually had a special ceremony in which they got money so, so I could actually go to medical school mm -hmm. because I couldn't afford it, didn't wow. have the funds. And so I then made the dean's list the first year. Second year, I actually I became the ranking student in my class. And then uh, I finished, as, as a matter of fact, after four years, the number one student in my class, which was absolutely uh, unbelievable because uh, I had such a mediocre beginning. So uh, when I finished uh, number one in the class, I then applied for my internship, and I got accepted to go to Cincinnati. But in Cincinnati, they would never had any blacks in residency mm -hmm, programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, they'd had their first Jewish resident. So I applied there for surgery, and I got turned down. So I did my first year of uh, surgical residency at Harlem Hospital. But at Harlem Hospital... Columbia University ran the program there, and they treated us as, uh, as stepchildren. And I didn't like it. And I, I, I heard about the great things that were going on at Howard University uh, with LaSalle LaFall and mm -hmm. Jack White and Mickey Syfax. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I transferred at the end of my first year to Freeman's Hospital at Howard yes. University. So... Uh, that made a big difference because it was like night and day. It was then that I realized the difference in historically black colleges and uh, right. other colleges. And so Meharry opened the door for me. Uh, and during my third year, I went to Dayton, Ohio. And it was there that at that point I wanted to become a, a medical missionary. And I was thinking of being a, becoming an internist. But something happened there as, as a patient who was a GI bleeder. Mm -hmm. The internists couldn't stop the bleeding, so they called the surgeons. Surgeons came in, they operated, saved the patient's life, and he was gone home in five days. Mm -hmm. That was an epiphany for me because it said to me that, uh, hey, maybe I want to be a surgeon because uh, the, the turnaround and the, the change in life-saving items was greater. And so that's when I decided I wanted to become a surgeon. And Dr. Callender, when did you decide to focus on transplant surgery? How did that happen? Another dramatic uh, occasion, there was a guy named William Matori, Dr. William Matori. He's a revolutionary guy who did all, all kinds of things uh, really before that time. And uh, so as part of our residency, we did uh, transplants in animals. And so I, I, I learned how to do transplants in animals. But this was in the 60s, mm -hmm. and transplant was just beginning. Uh, and first, I needed to do my uh, medical missionary work, but that introduced me to transplantation. Uh, so that opened up another chapter in my life because as I finished my surgery residency, I then had the opportunity for my life stream to, to come true. And that was when I had the opportunity to go to Africa to spend the first nine months as a, a medical missionary and as a surgeon and to leave the team uh, and surgery over there. So uh, this then was my life dream. And so as soon as I passed my boards, uh, I went to Port Harcourt, Nigeria, and I got the chance to operate on so many different uh, things. And it was uh, opened the door to me to a chapter of my life that stayed open ever since that point. But when I came back from the first year in, in, in Africa, I had lost 50 pounds. Oh, my goodness. And so they studied and did many medical tests and found nothing. 
But I wanted to go back to Africa again. This time, I lost 30 pounds, and I contracted malaria. So oh, to me, the message was loud and clear that I better come back to the United wow. States wow. And, 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 and do my work. So with that, I then accepted a transplant fellowship at the University of Minnesota. And with John Nigerian, who at that time was uh, leading transplant programs in the country. And uh, so I spent two years, a year of research and clinical experience in transplantation. And then learned enough to come back and start the transplant program at, at Freedman's Hospital and Howard University. Well, certainly you've become an icon in the field of organ transplantation. And uh, one of the things that I know that you've been focused on is why do minorities have a lack of trust in organ donation and transplantation. So what do you think the biggest obstacle you face in trying to get people to understand how important it is? Well, you know, here's what happened. Uh, in 1978, members of the Southeastern Organ Procurement Foundation came to me after I started the program in, at Howard in 1973 and did our first transplant in 1974. Uh, and I, I noticed that most of the donors that we got were from white patients. Mm -hmm. But they brought data to me that demonstrated that while blacks had more hypertension and diabetes and needed transplants more and were on dialysis more than any other ethnic group, they were rarely donors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they came to me to ask me what I could do to help solve the problem. Now, what happens when you're a minority and you, they ask you to solve a problem? What invariably happens is they run out of money, and so they <laughs> didn't have any money to help me. Mm -hmm. What we did in, in retrospect was was interesting because I didn't think any one person could make a difference anyway. But Dr. James Baton and I, uh, he's the eminent psychologist at Howard, and I looked at the data and realized that this was a mismatch. We needed organs so much, but we were really donors. I think 3% of the donors at that point were blacks. And 70% of the people on dialysis in the southeastern part of the United States were blacks. Mm -hmm. So even though they had no money to help us, Dr. Baton and I went to Howard University to the president and to the medical director and were able to get $500 to use to try to go to the black residents in D.C. and get an answer to the question, why is it that blacks are reluctant to become donors? Uh, and we we came up and found the five reasons. But what was exciting about it is not only did we find the five reasons, but we also recognized that when we started this study, only two out of 40 would actually sign donor cards. But at the end of our focus sessions, which were about two hours of 40 people, we gave them a financial, about $50 a piece. And at the end of the focus sessions, all 40 signed donor cards. Wonderful. So this said to us that only did we identify the five reasons, we also identified a strategy to overcome the obstacles that led to this. So I think our listeners would like to know what those five reasons were that you found. <laughs> okay. The first <laughs> one was the fact that blacks were unaware of the fact that they needed organs more than anybody else. Number two, they were unaware that they were predisposed to hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Thirdly, they needed to become part of the solution to the problem. So our job was to make them aware of that. That's number one. Second had to do with religious myths and misperceptions. Concerns that in that great getting up morning, you go to the pearly gates, you don't have but one kidney, you only got one wing. If you don't have your eyes, you aren't able to see great-grandmama mm -hmm. in the hereafter. Most religions realize that it is it actually isn't giving that you receive, and transplanting is fine. Uh, and so we then recognize that we need to get the message out that it is the right and religious and, and proper thing to do, uh, and that uh, no major religion is actually opposed to organ donation. The third had to do with a basic concern that if I sign a donor card, they might be more interested with getting my organs and tissues that was saving my life. Mm -hmm. And so we had to address that issue as mm -hmm. well. And then the fourth issue had to do with a concern that in the past history, people of color have been abused by being used as guinea pigs in many, many instances. Mm -hmm. uh, we then had to overcome this by having people of color, like you and me who are in positions of authority, 
who can uh, show that we can make a difference and allow our people of color to have trust in us and to overcome that distrust barrier. And then the final, the fifth uh, issue that we identified was the basic racism, a fear that if I'm black and I give my organs, they're only going to go to white people. And so because of what we learned between 1982 and 1984, we started the D.C. Organ Donor Program. And we, we thought that we should go into churches. You know, because of my religious background, I was comfortable going into churches. And so we, we started going to churches to talk and educate about organ and tissue donation and transplantation. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, after uh, two years, uh, the number of blacks who signed donor cards and had family discussions uh, doubled. And mm. uh, at that time, the Dow Chemical Company Take Initiative Program began. Dow Chemical was involved because they had Agent Orange, which caused cancer and many other horrible things to happen mm -hmm. to our veterans. And so they needed a positive image. So they, they heard what we were doing. And they sponsored me going across the nation to 26 cities in the United States and four historically black colleges to talk about the need for black organ donors. What happened also is they also did a Gallup poll between 1985 and 1990. And we did this work between 1986 and 1991. And uh, it showed that the number of blacks who are now aware of the highly successful nature of transplantation had tripled the number of people who signed donor cards had tripled. So this said to us that while initially we thought we were not going to be successful in accomplishing this because nobody else had even thought about trying it before, we then said, hey, we got something here. And so what we've done in the black community, which they said would never work, has worked. And so let's take this and apply this to all of the people of color. And so with that in mind, we conceptualized MOTEP, the National Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program, which are going to the, uh, across the United States into sections that, where they have different ethnic minority groups. So 25 cities across the United States, we, we made them MOTEP sites. And each of these sites, we went into the community to educate and empower them to become part of the solution. And what we did that was special, which hadn't been done before was that in the past, uh, many of the research efforts would go into the communities, and that was it. They went to the community, did their research, and left it, but they didn't leave anything in the community. Mm -hmm. And so what we did, we went to the community and actually funded them to become educated and mm -hmm. to, for them uh, to take the message to the community to educate and empower them to make a difference. And over the next uh, period of time, because of the support of Lewis Stokes, Lewis Sullivan and John Ruffin. We were able to get some $16 million between 1993 and 2010 to establish these MOTEP sites across the country. Lo and behold, as a consequence of what we did, that work we did, the number of African Americans who donated tripled. The number of people of color who donated doubled. And so we made a difference with this uh, effort that nobody thought was possible. I didn't think it was possible either at the beginning, but it's, it's made a monumental difference, and I'm thrilled. It absolutely has. So a little bit of biology here. You might want to explain to our listeners why it's necessary for African Americans to be part of the donor pool, given the fact that, you know, one would imagine that a kidney is a kidney, but it's certainly not that simple. So can you just help us understand why we need representation in the donor pool. What we need is to have organs from all ethnic groups in order for us to have success and that we need to have matches regardless of ethnicity. Right. We need to have histocompatibility and, and matches and that makes the difference. If The better the match, the longer the survival. And for all, all Americans, all ethnic groups, they need to become part of the solution to this problem. This month is National Minority Donor Awareness Month and uh, our efforts are to get all people of color to recognize uh, how important it is for us to become part of the solution to this problem. Because not only must we donate organs, but we also must develop healthy lifestyles, eat healthy, exercise, and eat the right food and uh, exercise in order to prevent the need for transplantation in the first place. And as the name of our 
uh, MOTEP grant that we first got was prevent the need, because that is the real issue, because we are so disproportionately afflicted and affected with hypertension and diabetes that uh, while we need organs and tissues for transplantation, we also need to adopt healthy lifestyles. So one of the challenges we have is getting more African Americans to choose the medical fields related to transplantation, such as nephrology, transplant surgery. And one of the things that we're doing is to partner with organ procurement organizations around the country so that our students get exposed to those kinds of disciplines. So what kind of impact do you think those kinds of programs could have in this, in this problem? Well, I think it's uh, pretty revolutionary in many ways. First is that you've got some 56 or 57 regional organ procurement organizations, and at the helm of these organizations, they're really all blacks. I, I know that over the last two or three years, we've doubled the number of people of color at the helm, but that we've got to understand what doubling means, <laughs> it means going from one to two yes. or going from three to six, right. you know, which is a small right, number. Right. Uh, but I think it is imperative that the thing that actually Dr. Hill just started is a program that uh, is vital because we have been relatively left out of the field in, in, in positions of power in these organizations. And so at all levels, I think it's important to educate and empower people of color so they can become throughout the organizations, from the top level to the bottom, to be involved. The, the more we're involved, the better off we are uh, because diversity begets ingenuity and uh, having people of color in those positions is best for all of us. And so looking at the Starkly Black College program that uh, actually Dr. Hilton started is something that uh, I think is a tremendous force for change. And I think it's uh, one of the wisest things we could do. I think one of the pivotal things that I observed was what happened with the Bahari involvement. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, eye-opening to see the results of the research that the freshman medical students did uh, that opened the, the door to recognizing one of the important items that must be addressed, and that is to have a referral, appropriate yes. referral and timely referral. And it's things like this that occur when you have people of color and you have diversity in areas that allow us to be successful. I also have been involved in wanting to take this from the elementary school level because I mm, think mm -hmm. the elementary students, the parents, and the teachers all need to know from the get-go that there are positions in the field of transportation that they need to be parcel of. And without them, we don't have the equity that we must have in order for us to have uh, successful transplantation. I, I, and I agree, Dr. Callender, one of the things that we did was to adopt two middle schools to make sure that the, those kids in, in middle school could get exposed to our medical students and dental students and know that those careers are possible for them. And that's been a really wonderful program to be a part of. Now, the other thing that I was going to ask you about, you know, we have 107 HBCUs in our country, and they're all embedded in primarily minority communities. Do you think that there's some way to involve their networks in solving this problem? Yeah, I think that's the next step. And so as we go forward, we need to try to get grants that allow us to effectively do that. Once you start doing that, I think uh, majority schools will want to be involved as well. Excellent. The last question I'd like to ask you is to have you give a call to action to our listeners. So what would you think the most important thing for our listeners to know or to act on as we strive for transplantation uh, equity? Well, I think the most important lesson is that uh, we need to be part of the solution to the problem. The uh, importance of opportunity is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in basketball, football, and all these sports, they used to not have black players. What a difference it's made. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we got the opportunity to participate. We need to do the same thing in uh, transplantation. Uh, all we need is to be given the opportunity. You know, one of the things that I've learned as I've gone along this journey is that it's okay to fail. You know, I, I've had many failures in my career. I talk about the successes, but actually uh, greatness comes when you not only 
allowed to feel, but retain your enthusiasm after you feel mm -hmm. and continue to battle so that you never give up. You continue to fight, continue to fight until you win. Well, you have an amazing life story that should be inspirational to any young person aspiring to do medicine or anything else for that matter. And on behalf of the Meharry family, we just want to thank you for what you've done over your life. It's been really impactful. And certainly, as I said earlier, in transplantation, you're certainly an icon. And we, we are just so happy that you've done the work you've done. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I, I, I love to tell my story because I love to inspire others to do what I did. And, and if I can do it, anybody else can do it. There's no unreachable star. There's no impossible dream. If you believe, you can do it. Thanks for listening to Public Service Announcement. To follow along on the rest of our journey, visit www.mmc.edu. And please remember to follow, rate, and review this show wherever you get your podcasts.